Hello, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. We are so excited to have you here. And I am very excited to also have Amy with us. Hi, Amy. Well, welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you here today for this workshop. And it's definitely something that we're passionate about with Full Plate. And of course, we have a program about it. But it all works perfectly if the tech works perfectly. So we understand that, you know, things do happen. Um, if you cannot hear us or see us, one of the best things you can do is to refresh your screen, refresh your connection, or to try a different browser. We have found that the uh, Google Chrome browser works very well with the service that we host these on. And um, I see everyone, if you've not found the chat, find the chat now, say hello, tell us where you're joining us from. Um, that is the beauty of tech too, is that we can join from all over. Um, even us three are in three different states. Um, so we see everyone from, oh my gosh, from North Carolina, from Missouri, from Michigan, Orlando, Colorado. So it's wonderful to have you here. We will have a recording of this workshop afterwards to share. So um, if something does happen, um, and you'll just end up needing to watch the recording. That is fine. We will have that for you. So um, again, buy the chat, say hello. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. And we do have a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, make sure that you save those up for later. Or if you need to post them, post them throughout the workshop. Amy and I will tag them. So we will try to get some of those answered for you. So it is my pleasure at this time to introduce you to Karen Smith. And Karen is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator. She has 18 years of experience as a registered dietitian in various settings, including public health, community nutrition programming, and clinical practice. Karen is an active member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and recently became board certified in lifestyle medicine. She's passionate about providing evidence-based information and resources to help people take control of their health. Karen is in the process of starting her own business, and you can learn more about it at karensmithrd.com. Welcome, Karen, and thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm looking forward to learning so much today. Oh, well, thank you so much, Michelle and Amy, for having me. It's wonderful to be here, and with so many people, it's so fun to see where everyone is from, and I recognize many of the names, so it's wonderful to be here with all of you today. Um, and as Michelle mentioned, um, I am a dietitian and certified in lifestyle medicine. And so it's really a pleasure for me to have an opportunity to talk to all of you about how food and, um, and certainly other lifestyle behaviors, but today we're really keeping the focus on food, how it affects our blood sugar and our risk for diabetes. So before we jump in, it is really important if you are under medical supervision for any reason that you talk with your healthcare provider uh, before you make lifestyle changes. And if you think that you might have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes and you've never been diagnosed, to work with a healthcare provider so that you can have the appropriate test done. Um, the presentation today really focuses on prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. However, the lifestyle recommendations that will be discussed uh, will likely also benefit someone with type 1 diabetes. And so again, it is important for people uh, to consult with their healthcare team um, before making lifestyle changes. So who does diabetes affect? Well, in the United States alone, almost 100 million adults have diabetes and, or have prediabetes. And more than 80% of those adults don't even know that they have it. Uh, so about a third of American adults under the age of 65 have prediabetes and about half of adults over 65 have prediabetes. And there's about 37 million Americans who have diabetes. And about 95% of the people living with diabetes in the US have type two diabetes. So that's again, where we'll be focusing our conversation today. And diabetes is kind of defined by having high blood sugar. And so some of the tests that are done 
to confirm or diagnose that someone has diabetes are a, fa a fasting blood glucose or fasting blood sugar. So just looking at what your blood sugar is after you haven't eaten for a period of time. And if that is higher than uh, 100, then you are either in that range of having prediabetes or diabetes. And then there's also an A1C, a hemoglobin A1C, that gives us a better picture of what your blood sugar is like, not just at one moment in time, but over a three month period. And so having an A1C of higher than 5.7 puts you in a category of either having prediabetes or diabetes if it's over 6.5 or 6.5% or higher. And insulin resistance is really the root cause of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. So what are risk factors? What puts you at risk for being insulin resistant? Well, there are a lot of things. Um, you'll see on here things like age, your family history, whether or not a parent, a sibling had diabetes, that increases your risk, your ethnicity, uh, being overweight or obese, uh, being physically inactive, and that means being active less than three times a week, smoking. Uh, smokers have a 30 to 40% uh, higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes than non-smokers, um, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, sleep disturbances, especially sleep apnea, and having a history of gestational diabetes, heart disease, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Abdominal obesity or that type of weight that we carry around our middle especially increases our risk for diabetes or for insulin resistance. So if you look at this list, you know, it might seem a little bit daunting, um, but to me it means that, wow, most of these things we have um, some control over, certainly not the genetic components or things like age and ethnicity, right? But our weight and our activity, smoking, our sleep, many of these things we um, can change with our lifestyle behaviors. And so I was hoping this would be animated, but I'll just do the dance myself. Diabetes can largely be prevented. And for most people living with type 2 diabetes, it can be put into remission with lifestyle change. Lifestyle behaviors can reduce diabetes risk by 90%. So yes, genetics can certainly increase our risk of um, having insulin resistance, but really play a small role. And our lifestyle behaviors, and especially the foods that we eat, um, really make a huge difference um, and, and effect, you know, can significantly reduce our risk of becoming insulin resistant. So that's empowering to know that we have a lot of control over what we're putting in our bodies every day with our food choices, how we're moving our bodies, how we manage stress and sleep, um, and avoiding risky substances like tobacco. All of these things that we can do for ourselves significantly reduce our risk of diabetes. And today we're going to be spending um, our time talking specifically about healthful eating, one of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. So we're going to start by understanding the root cause. What is insulin resistance and how can we prevent it from happening in our bodies? So I want you all to imagine um, a single cell. That's what this blue circle is, a single cell inside one of your muscles or inside your liver, liver, just one cell. And imagine that this morning you woke up and you ate a bowl of oatmeal. I bet some of you did. You could probably type that in the chat box. I eat oatmeal. Um, as your body is digesting that oatmeal and breaking down the carbohydrates in the oatmeal or the other food that you eat into glucose, that glucose gets into your bloodstream. There's always glucose in your bloodstream. You need it to be alive. And that's why having too low blood sugar, right? When people have um, hypo or low blood sugar, that can be life-threatening, right? Our bodies need to have sugar as a means of energy in our blood. 
All right, so after we eat this oatmeal or whatever the food is with carbohydrates, our blood sugar goes up. Well, our brain sense that because our bodies do want to keep that level of sugar in our blood, you know, in a certain range. And so our brain senses there's more sugar in the blood and tells our pancreas, uh, an organ that makes insulin, which is a hormone, that our brain say, okay, pancreas, secrete some insulin. Insulin is going to attach to our muscle cells and our liver cells on the surface, and it acts as a key. So the insulin attaches to receptors, and as a result, communication takes place inside our cell, and that sugar out in our bloodstream is allowed to go inside our cell where it's supposed to be so that our cells can either burn that glucose for energy or store it for later use. Our bodies actually store some glucose in the form of glycogen for when we need it, you know, maybe during exercise or after a period of fasting so our sugar doesn't go too low. So insulin resistance develops when we have the accum accumulation of fat inside our cells. That is what you see depicted by those yellow blobs. All right, so too much fat inside our cells, and especially our muscle cells, our liver cells, our pancreas cells, they are not supposed to be storage depots for fat. And that accumulation really interferes with insulin's ability to work. All right, so we have fat inside our cells. We eat the oatmeal. Our blood sugar still goes up. Our pancreas still secretes insulin. All right, all of that's working well. The insulin attaches to the receptor sites on our cell, but now there's a breakdown in communication because that fat is getting in the way. It's like putting chewing gum in a lock. You can put the key in, but you can't turn it and open the door. So sugar stays out in our bloodstream. And this insulin resistance can, it's a progressive process. We can be more or less insulin resistant depending on how much fat has built up inside our cells. So as I said, food plays a huge role in, you know, whether or not we develop insulin resistance. So I'm going to throw this question out to the group because I see lots of wonderful things happening in the chat box. What do you think about this question? How might the standard American diet increase insulin resistance? How might it lead to that fat accumulation inside our cells? I see too much animal fat in the diet, too much sugar, processed foods. All right, you're absolutely right. Too much fat, sugar, salt, red meat. This pie graph is showing you that about 70% of the calories that Americans consume come from added fat, oils, sugar, and animal products. Only a very small percentage, 9%, come from vegetables, fruits, and legumes. And of that 22% of calories coming from grains, a very small percentage come from whole grains. So most of what Americans are consuming are foods with added fats, oils, and sugars, animal foods, and refined grains, or white flour, white rice, and processed foods made with those products. So this is just another depiction for you to see the types of foods that Americans are eating you know, uh, on average every day. Um, the good news is you'll see, wow, things are getting a little bit better from, you know, 1999 to 2000 um, uh, to moving forward to 2011 to 2012, the intake of fruits and vegetables went up a little bit. Um, same for whole grains and the refined sugars went down. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're still not eating very many whole foods, not very many fruits and vegetables, whole grains or legumes, and a lot of processed foods, as you all mentioned in the chat box. And that is exactly what causes insulin resistance. All right, so foods like this. And that standard American diet is high in saturated fat because of the added oils, because of the percentage of animal foods people are consuming, um, because of the processed foods with those added oils. It's high in those refined carbohydrates. 
It's low in fiber, which we're going to talk a whole lot more about. There's very little fruits, veggies, whole grains, and beans. And as a result of people not eating a lot of those whole um, unprocessed foods, people aren't getting enough of certain vitamins, things like vitamin C and minerals like potassium, and certainly not things like antioxidants and phytochemicals, compounds uh, specifically found in plants um, that really help uh, reduce the risk of chronic disease. So let's talk about the good news. What foods reduce insulin resistance? Whole unprocessed fiber foods. All right. So we're talking about all of your beautifully colored, um, vibrant fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes in particular. And that really is what full plate living is all about, really focusing on people making the majority of their plates consist of these whole fiber foods. So whole unprocessed plant foods. And as a result, that type of dietary pattern is low in saturated fat. It's low in refined carbohydrates like added sugars and white flour. It's really bulking up the fiber and we're eating lots more fruits, veggies, whole grains, and beans, and getting lots of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. So it's really doing a complete 180 from that standard American diet where I said nearly 70% of the calories. And if we add in those refined grains, it's over 75% of calories are coming from no or low fiber foods to just doing the exact swap, right? Like now we're loading our plates with whole uh, fiber rich foods. So how do we know that this works, right? This is what we're suggesting to reduce insulin resistance, uh, reduce the risk of diabetes. And perhaps if you have prediabetes or type two diabetes, to start reversing that insulin resistance and putting those uh, conditions in remission. Well, one way we know is that this wonderful study uh, conducted by Dr. Barnard and his team at the Physicians Committee, which took people with type 2 diabetes and randomized them to either a low-fat vegan diet, which means that people were eating fruits, vegetables, grains, um, primarily whole grains, and legumes, and legumes are those beans and lentils and soy foods. Uh, and really keeping fat from added oils quite low. So people were either following that or they were following a traditional American Diabetes Association diet. So still a much healthier diet than that standard American diet. There was no restriction on carbohydrate intake in that low fat vegan diet group. I really want to highlight that. People were encouraged to eat you know, as much of these whole foods as filled them up without any limitation on carbohydrate. So what happened? So what you'll see here is that the A1C in that low fat vegan group, so the people eating lots of whole high fiber foods, at the start of the study, their A1C was around 8%. So in, you know, that range of having what's considered uncontrolled diabetes. At the end of the study, so after 22 weeks, their A1C went down to 6.8. So almost getting to the point of no longer being in the diabetes range. Whereas the people following that American Diabetes Association diet started around eight as well, but their A1C, it did improve, but only went down to about seven and a half. All right, so this way of eating this, this method of really focusing on whole fiber foods works. And, you know, what would happen if we continued that study for even further to see, you know, that trend in A1C. Another study, um, so looking at uh, putting people uh, with diabetes who started out with an average A1C of 12.6%, very high, um, putting them on a diet of whole fiber foods. So what they were eating in this study was beans, vegetables, whole grains, some seaweed, and drinking green tea. 
after six months, their A1C went all the way down to 5.7%. So almost out of the range of even having prediabetes. So tremendous. And I want to point out again, so I'm not someone who loves to, you know, throw labels on dietary patterns or necessarily saying go out and eat a macrobiotic diet. It's really about what are the foods? What are the actual foods that people are eating in these studies? Um, and time and time again, we see that they're eating these whole fiber foods. Um, but looking at how many carbohydrates they were eating in a day, almost 400 grams. So 72% of the calories they were consuming were coming from carbohydrate, while only 16% of the calories they were consuming were coming from fat. And look at that fiber, 55 grams of fiber a day. So high fiber diets, regardless of you know, the, the label that people put on them, when people are eating a lot of these whole fiber foods, we know that that helps reduce blood sugar, weight, cholesterol, and inflammation. And this might be surprising to people, but we there's a consensus, consensus statement among endocrinologists, even though I hear lots, lots from um, people that I work with that, that they weren't told this information necessarily, but there is this shift in thinking that all people should strive to attain and maintain an optimal weight through a primarily plant-based meal plan. So let's talk a little bit more about what foods are best for blood sugar. So, you know, from what I've said so far, from what you've already learned and know, what do you think? Put it in the chat box. What foods are best for blood sugar? I see plants and black beans, vegetables, high fiber foods. Absolutely, all correct, right? We're talking about beans and legumes. Um, some of my favorites, uh, and especially for people with diabetes, you know, eating beans is something that can be quite powerful. Uh, the, the study here that is, um, any of the studies I'm mentioning are referenced at the end of the slides, if you want to learn more, um, but taking people and randomizing them to either eating five cups of beans a week. So not doing anything else, just saying add in five cups of beans a week or another group that was restricting calories by about 500 per day. And don't you know that the people who were eating beans lost just as much weight and had just as much improvement in blood sugar um, as the people who were restricting calories and like what fun it is to, you know, add foods versus taking things away. So beans are quite powerful for weight for blood sugar. And the people in the bean eating group also had better improvements in lowering cholesterol. So vegetables, all of them, any of them, whatever it is that you like, there's a huge variety. Um, have at it. They are all wonderful. And for the most part, very high in water right? So non-starchy vegetables, things like greens and broccoli and um, onions and, and, you know, cucumbers and tomatoes, you know, up to 90% water. And so very low in calories. So we can, you know, eat a large amount um, and get lots of vitamins and minerals and get fiber for very few calories. Same for fruits. And this is where there's a lot of misinformation about fruits for people with diabetes. Often people are told to restrict their intake of fruits because of the carbohydrate. But as you saw in those previous studies, um, it's okay to eat fruit. And, you know, study after study show that people who eat more fruit have a lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And even when we people have diabetes or prediabetes, fruit is an excellent choice because of all of the nutrients and fiber they contain and because they're, you know, essentially fat-free and don't have saturated fat with very few exceptions like coconut. All right, so whole grains, moving on. Um, 
this picture here is just showing you some of the ways in which grains can be uh, chopped up and, and broken down a little bit, right? If you start with oat groats, that's like the least processed form of oats that you can find and buy, and that's wonderful. Um, then you move on to steel cut, which basically just takes that oat groat and cuts it. Um, Scottish oats are getting ground down a little bit, so on and so forth. So with every step of this um, uh, process, you're not losing out on any nutrients, like the vitamins and minerals are still there. But what do you think happens if you're eating oat flour as opposed to the oat groats? How might that affect your blood sugar a little bit differently? So one thing that can happen as we're breaking down and grinding down foods, it makes it a little bit easier for our body to digest them. Our body doesn't have to work quite so hard. So our blood sugar might go up a little bit more quickly. Plus something like oat flour is going to be added to foods, right? You're not going to sit down with a bowl of flour and eat it with a spoon. You might be adding it into something that has um, maybe added fats, maybe added sugars, not all the time, right? But but the oat groats and working your way down um, that list, you know, starting at the top, the, the intact grains are always where you're going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of blood sugar control. And again, we're all different, right? So knowing how foods affect our blood sugar can be and affect, you know, how we feel and, and how full we feel, things like that, important to pay attention to. So whole grains, if you don't know, all that refers to is that uh, each single grain contains all three parts. So who knew, right? A grain has three parts to it. Like each single little rice kernel has three parts. And the the bran and the germ are the parts that contain the most nutrients, the most fiber, the most vitamins, the most minerals. Those are the parts that are taken away when grains are refined. So when you make white flour, when you make white rice, those parts are removed. And so you don't get all of those nutrients and fiber. So more examples of whole grains here, things like millet and barley and quinoa, um, black and wild rice, your oats, all wonderful options. And then nuts and seeds. Um, I suggest, you know, choosing the ones that are raw and unsalted because what happens when we add salt to foods? We tend to eat more of them, right? So because nuts and seeds are higher in fat. They are certainly um, extremely healthy foods and full of lots of nutrients and they have a little bit of fiber, right? However, because they have a higher fat content, it might be something to pay attention to how much you're eating and what's happening to your blood sugar um, as a result. So what about all the carbs? What about all the carbs in these high fiber foods and the fruits and the grains and the beans? They are full of carbohydrates. Well, it really boils down to how those carbs are packaged, right? So two slices of white bread or about three sweet potatoes have the same amount of calories. You know, which is going to give you the most nutrients, which is gonna give you the most fiber, which is going to fill you up the most? Could you even sit down and eat three sweet potatoes at one time, right? It really is about how the carbs are packaged. And we want to be, you know, choosing the foods that have the fiber and that are whole um, for the best results with our blood sugar. So a high fiber diet is by no means a low carbohydrate diet. We're really focusing on the types of foods that we're eating, not just the amount of carbohydrates, but how are those carbohydrates being packaged? So I am not a dietitian who loves to be super prescriptive with giving people certain amounts of foods to eat a day because we're all a little bit different. We all have um, different preferences and cultures and 
you know, t just certain foods make some of us feel a little more satisfied. Some of us might like to eat a little bit um, more whole grains than beans or vice versa, right? So this isn't something that I would say this is more of a, like a, a guideline um, and certainly depending on um, your health conditions too, this could certainly be tailored. And, and to some extent, I would say some of these servings are minimum servings, like by all means, eat more vegetables, by all means, eat more fruits if you want. Um, but really trying to get some cooked beans every day, wonderful way to help improve blood sugar. And beans and whole grains have a wonderful way of not just helping lower your blood sugar at the meal that you eat them, but also later when you have your next meal, um, there's a second meal effect where your blood sugar at that next meal will likely be lower after eating beans at the prior meal. So beans and whole grains, awesome foods to be including in your diet. Certainly getting in some raw greens or cooked greens, um, other types of veggies, whatever it is that you like, whether they're raw or cooked, you know, however you can get vegetables into your diet and on your plate, go for it. There's no wrong way to do it. Um, same for fruits, whatever it is that you like best. Um, and then keeping those nuts and seeds, like certainly including them in your diet and maybe aiming for about a quarter cup or less per day. When it comes to bread, um, Ezekiel bread is a very high fiber bread that also doesn't have a lot of um, it doesn't have any added sugars or preservatives. And so a really good choice for getting in a high fiber food. All right, so with full plate living, the emphasis is on making 75% of your plate these whole high fiber, high water foods, right? And that other 25% of your plate is whatever you want it to be. Um, and I want to say, especially if you are looking to reverse insulin resistance, what you choose to put on that 25% of your plate can make all the difference in helping um, reverse insulin resistance, right? So thinking through what do you want that 25% to be? And really thinking of your food choices like investments, you know, which are going to give you the greatest return. You know, you could have an apple or a chocolate chip cookie, you know, on paper, they're both going to be about the same amount of calories, perhaps, maybe even about the same amount of carbohydrate, but entirely different in terms of what they're going to do for our blood sugar and our, and our bodies. So what about the cost? And I'd love to get some um, thoughts from you all in the chat right now. You know, is it too expensive to eat whole fiber foods? Okay, Karen says, I find cost to be a big issue. No, from Theodosia, no from Kamal. All right, so there's a mix here, some yeses, some nos. Um, as someone who loves sticking to a budget when it comes to food, um, you know, the first tip I think that's important is to know your budget. You know, how much money do you want to be spending? How much money do you have to spend on food, whether it's per week or per month? But starting from that place of really understanding how much it is that you have to spend, um, I actually use an app. Some people use apps to track their calories. I use an app to track my budget. So I know every month, here's my budget for food. And every time I go and buy food, I put in what I spent so I can stick to my budget. Um, and then having a plan, right? Having a plan for what you're going to eat, how you're going to use food also goes a long way in being able to maybe cook one meal and eat twice, right? To not waste food. Um, using frozen fruits and veggies, especially for me right now, um, getting into the colder months, there aren't as many um, fresh options. Um, the frozen fruits and veggies are often more cost affordable. And then I also don't have to worry about things, you know, spoiling. 
uh, buying dried beans and lentils versus canned, although I will still argue that canned beans are way cheaper than meat. Um, hitting the bulk section of stores, you know, it can be a great way to test out different types of grains, different types of beans, and even different types of spices, which often are way less expensive in an ethnic grocery store or in the ethnic aisle of your grocery store. And keeping it simple, you know, every meal we eat doesn't have to be a taste explosion, you know, having a simple sweet potato maybe with some black beans and salsa can be an inexpensive, very healthy and tasty meal. So some ideas here for some simple budget-friendly meals. Uh, and there are lots of resources out there online, things like Budget Bites, uh, plant-based on a budget. There are websites that give people resources and sample menus and recipes to really stick within a certain budget. So go ahead and, oh, I see Aldi is a game changer. Absolutely. I agree with that, Karen. Um, what is your favorite low cost whole fiber food? Go ahead and drop that in the chat box. I would say cabbage and bananas are probably my two favorite. Those two are consistently um, very inexpensive. So we talked a lot about the foods. What about beverages? You know, making water your beverage of choice is certainly uh, the best. And coffee and teas can also be excellent, um, especially green tea and herbal teas packed with antioxidants. However, they also can be vehicles for people to be adding a lot of sugar and oils, right? So when you're drinking them without those things, great. Um, soft drinks, juices and juice drinks, sports drinks, alcohol, all of these things add a lot of calories for very little nutrition. And so if you choose to drink any of these beverages, you know, making them that 25% of your plate is what's suggested. Lots of times people want to know, how much water do I need to drink in a day? Is it eight glasses? Is it 10 glasses? And the answer is it depends. Um, you know, things like our, our size, our activity level, um, you know, even certain medical conditions or medications we take all can affect how much water we need. And, you know, using your urine color as a guide to help you know if you're hydrated is wonderful. Um, it should be a pale yellow. Uh, and it is important to stay hydrated. This is a way to help lower blood sugar. So in summary, you know, our whole fiber foods are the best. Um, I hope I gave you some ways today to maybe think about how to start including more of them into your diet if you're not already following the full plate method. Um, and I'd love for you to share one thing you learned in the chat box and also one way you can eat more whole fiber foods in the chat. Thanks so much, everybody. This was wonderful. Well, and thank you for being here and teaching us so many things, Karen. This was wonderful. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I actually really like the data of looking at the studies of what people that have diabetes were doing, the options they were given, and then the great results that they had after eating a high fiber diet um, that's heavy in these whole process. And there, I somebody mentioned, they made a comment and said, oh, I just have to agree with that. I love the colors. There's so many textures that come up from these different foods, and it's a beautiful way to eat. If you are not a member with Full Plate Living, I highly encourage you to sign up at fullplateliving.org, where we will share a recording of this workshop. You will also have access to other workshops that we have done in the past. Karen has done a wonderful recording for us on carbohydrates and diabetes um, that's in our Imagining Diabetes program as well. And thank you for your help with that, Karen. So um, again, thank you for being here with us today. Karen, thank you for your insights and your help. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.